This is Indian Country Today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahant. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. The 117th Congress is now in session, with members taking the oath of office this weekend. The Senate will not be able to organize until an election in Georgia on Tuesday. There are two seats up for grabs, and the results will determine which party will control the Senate. The House has elected Nancy Pelosi as the Speaker for the fourth time. This is the first Congress to have six indigenous people serving from both parties. Among them is Deb Holland from New Mexico, who won her second term. She says this swearing in was much different due to the coronavirus pandemic and called the work Congress must do urgent. In a statement, she said, I'm proud to be a member of the 117th Congress and will continue fighting to bring opportunity to everyone and ensure we have a healthy planet for future generations. President-elect Joe Biden has nominated Holland to serve as Interior Secretary. She will remain in Congress during the confirmation hearings that are set for February. Once confirmed, she will then step down from her congressional seat. When the Electoral College votes are counted on Wednesday, one Republican representative will object. Mark Wayne Mullen, who is Cherokee Nation, says it's his right under the Constitution to protest. He told Fox News three states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Arizona, have voting issues. As the nation braces for another outbreak of COVID-19 cases after the holidays, the Chickasaw Nation in Oklahoma is opening up nine caring cottages. These homes will provide a safe place for COVID-positive tribal citizens to isolate safely. Located in Ada, Oklahoma, the tribe is also opening up the caring cottages to Native Americans who live in the service area, plus employees of the nation and their in-home dependents if they become COVID positive. Each home is fully furnished and stocked with food, plus the homes have Wi-Fi and video conferencing capabilities to call their physician. The homes also have a front porch, so those who are in isolation can still enjoy being outside at a safe distance. Last year was, well, a little bleak on a number of fronts, so we are starting our first full week of the new year with a burst of light and color and joy. We bring you the story of a young Lakota and Navajo graffiti artist who travels the country using new tools to spread ancient culture and wisdom. Stuart Huntington has more. A wall is a wall is a wall, unless perhaps Derek Focus Smith leads a group of students painting it. You have a wall that's inside of the community painted by local community members and that um, automatically makes those students, makes those kids feel like they're connected to the community. It acts as outdoor advertising, like, like a billboard outdoor classroom to be more precise. Smith, who goes by the single name Focus, is part of the group Thrive Unlimited that uses culturally based solutions to issues facing Native communities. Their message, we're not just still here, we're thriving. Focus uses graffiti to tell this story. My people had always told stories through symbols. And so those adorned um, our clothes, those adorned our, our shoes, those adorned our teepees. And so what I'm doing is nothing more than just reproducing that same storytelling culture, just with an updated version of it. Being extra careful in the pandemic, Focus traveled widely this year from his base near the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, putting up murals in Colorado, Staten Island, and as far away as France. He invites the community, especially the local youth, to help paint. Ancient practices have always evolved. He's drawing from old ways and taking on these new tools and graffiti is this uh, newer way of doing things and, and a lot of the youth are very um, compelled by it. It brings it to the kids in a way where they're like, they know rap, you know, they know the hip hop culture, they know the hip hop community. Once those students are done painting that mural and there's a picture of like the white buffalo calf or something else there, Whatever was done during that time when we were painting and whatever knowledge was shared with them, now they'll turn around and say, hey, you know, you know, this is what that means. And they'll tell their friends and then they'll tell their friends. And it puts it in a way where they're going to be proud to tell their friends because you know what? When we get done painting a mural, it's going to look awesome. 
and it's going to look cool. And that's, that's what it is. And like, that's what I do is I, I push that culture forward. Stuart Huntington, Indian Country Today. Focus is starting the new year as artist in residence at the Red Cloud Indian School on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Mark Trahan. Coming up, we look at the economy as the pandemic continues and what will it take to make that healthy too. Patrice Kunish has served in a variety of roles. She has been a deputy solicitor with the Interior Department and recently headed the Center for Economic, Indian Economic Development at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank. She's now advancing her own mission with her own consulting firm, Pahin Haha Consulting. She is of Standing Rock descent. Welcome back to Indian Country Today, Patrice. Thank you, Mark. Happy New Year and uh, really Congratulations on everything Indian Country Today is doing for all of Indian Country. Thank you so much. Let's start, start by talking about an op-ed you recently authored about uh, the challenges facing both the pandemic and the new administration. Maybe start by talking about the big picture here. The big picture obviously is the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic recovery. And as we go into 2021, we know that we are going to have a, a, a very brutal winter with a surge in, in, in COVID infections and, and you know, higher death rates. Uh, with the new restrictions on, on businesses and services, I think we're going to see some very rocky economic recovery. We saw some jobs reports recently that show jobs are, are just really weak and in, in, in coming back. And what that means for Indian country is, is extremely important because of course, tribal government businesses are the main source of employment and wages uh, for tribal and reservation citizens. Um, so we have to get the pandemic under control. We have to address racial inequalities. We really have to uh, make sure that, that the opportunities for recovery are shared broadly and obviously address many of these racial and economic disparities. How should the federal government be um, working to make sure that tribes are uh, in as best shape as possible throughout this? My perspective with the new uh, Secretary of the Department of the Interior, Deb Holland, is the possibility for an amazing new federal Indian policy. And this would be an all Fed policy embracing uh, the treaties as a trust responsibility of the entire federal government, not just the, the Department of the Interior through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. What I would suggest for uh, Secretary Holland is really to focus on the efficiencies of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in delivering those services, uh, really focus on operations and management, making sure that the BIA is staffed, properly resourced, and can support tribes in their self-governance. It's the only policy that has ever worked. It also ensures that tribes are driving their own solutions within the communities. There are a lot of technical things that the BIA can do to make lending and, and the flow of capital to Indian country much more normalized and much more robust. Um, but when I think about the all Fed policy, it's not just the BIA. Uh, we leave billions and billions of dollars on the table, Indian country wide, every single year because they're not tapped into, they're not accessed, tribes are not ready to roll out housing projects through HUD or energy projects through uh, EPA. We need to be shovel ready and able to receive and use these funds uh, immediately. I've spent a lot of time reading about the pandemic in 1919. And as you know, there used to be these BIA superintendent reports where they would go through the economy tribe by tribe and talk about what's working and wasn't what wasn't. Uh, after the pandemic of 1919, there was so much economic activity and there was so much pent up action. 
How do you make sure that you take advantage of that so that entrepreneurs and others beyond tribes can basically be unleashed? You're so right, Mark. After the, the pandemic of the early 1900s, we actually had a, a, a federal government along with state governments poised and ready to invest in people. And a lot of those investments were workforce training, creating jobs and opportunities like a national service uh, workforce. And we also had deep investments in infrastructure, roads. And at that time, it was rural electrification. And from my experience working with the Department of Agriculture through rural development, we have enormous opportunities here in Indian country for investments in broadband services. You know, the pandemic has made us realize that we're never going back to the way it was and that we've got technology really driving the dynamics of workforce. But technology is also driving the way we learn and, and, and with schools going online, the way we deliver medicine and health benefits and so forth. So absolutely, we need to uh, tap into the federal services and programs and state opportunities to extend broadband services, internet connections to Indian country. That means we need to think about uh, how we develop communities in Indian country. Housing is one of the most important drivers of economic development, but it's also was one of the, the, the more tragic drivers of the increase of the pandemic with multi-generational homes, uh, poor sanitation conditions, and actually uh, poor access to food. So we, we have to address the community infrastructure from a housing perspective. And that to me is going to improve overall workforce stability, family stability. And then as we think about bringing back jobs, what kind of jobs do we need, Mark? One of the concerns I have, one of my major concerns is that jobs on reservations are highly concentrated in two sectors. One is tribal government and the other is uh, the gaming. The tribal government administration really provides all the services, essential services to, to native communities. Gaming is a fantastic economic opportunity and collectively, tribes were the 13th largest employer in the United States pre-pandemic. But with restrictions on businesses, especially services, the service industry, food, beverage, you know, entertainment, we're losing not just jobs, we're losing livelihoods. And this concentration of jobs in the government uh, is, is really leaving Indian country extremely vulnerable. So we absolutely need to think about diversifying. Diversifying means we need to think about job training programs. We absolutely should be tapping into educational institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and really thinking about deep investments in our children's education from early childhood, you know, all the way through professional uh, education. Wow, there's so much there. I was thinking of just about housing. Um, we have half of the equation already in many cases, and that's land. And if you have land and not the opportunity to access capital, that becomes the problem rather than the actual housing. If you can unleash that, you can have all the housing you need. You're so spot on, and it's sort of my mantra as well. Land is Indian country's biggest ex, uh, asset. And if we can open up that land to productive use, and it could be residential, it could be business, it could be agriculture where we are really feeding ourselves good nutritional food. But when I go back to uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, there's a thing called the, uh, the TSR. And these are the title, title status reports that are required for every leasehold interest. So for the tribes that own more than 60 million acres of land, trust land, to unleash those lands, open those lands up for productive use, we need to work hand in glove with the Bureau of Indian Affairs to get this land um, leased and open for, for productive use, like for businesses, for housing, for energy development. Now, 
the Bureau of Indian Affairs is, is just not a smooth operation and lenders do not want to provide capital lending resources when they know that these processes are stuck, they're stymied, and sometimes can take years to get a simple title report that we would normally get uh, you know, in 30 to 60 days from, uh, from an off-reservation transaction. So we absolutely need to tap into the land. We need to ensure the BIA knows this is a priority. And they can do that with uh, turning on the spigots of the Hearth Act, for example, where tribes themselves take control over land leasing and land use. That to me is, is, is an amazing tool, an incredible resource, uh, but it's sadly, it's, it's not well known and, and not well utilized. So much of the challenge with the Bureau of Indian Affairs is shifting from a, a government agency to a government support group that works with tribal governments to take the lead. How do you get that message through to the federal government? Well, we have Deb Holland, who <laughs> knows this intimately, personally, has experienced you know, the pain and peril of, 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 of economic distress. Uh, and I think she knows that uh, Indian country, with all of our oversized expectations, really need to get down to the basics. And the basics is, uh, as you said, making the Bureau of Indian Affairs more of a service provider, technical assistance, clearing the way for good business development and, and supporting the essential human services. You know, the Bureau of Ed Indian Education is, 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 is woefully under-supported, under-resourced, and that drag is not just a, an administrative drag, it's a drag on our children and our children's uh, future. Uh, so there's a lot to turn around in the BIA. I, I know folks there really want to make a difference and with the tools, the resources, the motivation and the support, I think they're ready to be good partners with Indian country. Thank you so much for joining us today, Patrice Kunish. We'll see you again. All right, thank you, Mark. We'll be right back. Holly Cook Macaro has worked for Tribal Nations for more than 20 years as an advocate in Washington. She is a citizen of the Red Lake Nation. She's a partner with Spirit Rock Consulting, and she's a familiar voice on Indian Country Today. Welcome back, Holly. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. This week, the stakes in Congress are really remarkable. As we mentioned in the newscast, there are a record number of indigenous representatives. And um, I guess I let me start by just asking what it's like for the first few days of a new Congress. W what are the challenges? Well, um, it is remarkable. As you said, we have six Native American and or, or indigenous um, members this Congress, and their experiences are going to be very different. We have Congressman Tom Cole, who is beginning what I believe is his 10th term in office. So he is this more, our, our more senior member, when I say our, um, of our Native American Indigenous crew. Um, so he is, a, as a senior member, he is going to be involved in managing the Republican caucus's message strategy overall. And then on a more technical basis, he is um, from his perch on the rules committee. He has a, a very large influence over how um, floor issues um, and floor bills are handled. So there are some changes to the rules package overall for the 117th Congress that give a little more power to the minority. I'm sure that Congressman Tom Cole had a role in that. Um, so I expect that we will see him um, in the headlines and he is a frequent commentator um, in, in the news as well. So I think Congressman Cole, who is familiar to many of us because of his longtime advocacy for tribes um, in the Republican caucus and overall, he will be busy doing that. And then we have, of course, Mark Wayne Mullen, who is right after him beginning, let's see, I believe his fifth term in office. I, I think he was elected in 2012, if I recall correctly. And he serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is one of the more prestigious committees in the, in, in the House. It handles probably a third of all legislation that is considered 
by the House. So I expect that his focus will be on the activities at the Energy and Commerce Committee. We go um, to Sharice Davids and who will be a sophomore member um, of Congress, which is again, in and of a feat of its, in, in, in and of a feat in itself. As you will recall, um, three years ago, it was about two years ago, Congresswoman Davids flipped a seat from red to blue. And that was a, a tough race. It was not an initially targeted race, but she won it very comfortably, um, nearly double digits. I believe she won it by nine points in 2020. And that I think is due in large part to the hard work that she put in both on the ground in the district and the profile that she maintained in the Congress. And in terms of just digging in, doing the work, staying on message and really paying attention to the messaging and of, of her constituency at home. So I expect that Congresswoman Davids will um, continue to focus on her committee assignments on transportation and I, um, armed services. And I think I have those two correct. And she was also newly elected as the vice chair of the New Democrat Coalition, the New Democrat Caucus. So I think that also is a terrific recognition of the leadership of um, Congresswoman Davids in the House and a sure sign of things to come as well. We have from there, of course, Congresswoman Deborah Holland, who was sworn in yesterday. She will stay in office. She does not have to resign from the House until she is confirmed. As we all know, um, if, if anyone did miss it, um, in Indian country, she was nominated um, to be the Secretary of the Interior by President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris. So I know that the preparation for her confirmation hearings have begun, the meetings with the Senate have begun. So I, I, I think while Congresswoman Holland will certainly be, be paying attention to the activities in the House and her responsibilities there, she also has um, her plate full as she begins um, the preparation and going through all of those pre-meetings with members of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee in the Senate and does all of the necessary preparation for the confirmation hearings. From there we have, let's see, that was, that was four, we have Congresswoman Yvette Harrell, a freshman from, from New Mexico. Um, she will be awaiting, I, I think, committee assignments. There will be freshman class elections. Um, I think she will be, you know, while certainly focused on constituent services, it does new members, they need to hire a staff, they need to go through all of those things. So that focus will be there. Um, and, and Yvette Harrell is, is on the Republican side. The sixth member we have is Kai Kahele, Congressman Kai Kahele from Hawaii, um, also a freshman member. He has served in, in, um, in, the, in the state legislature side, so I expect that he will um, hit the ground running somewhat, having, I, I assume he will bring some staff with him. He will have some familiarity with the legislative process. Um, but again, you know, finding his way around the Congress, getting the committee assignments, building his staff. Those are all key things. And, and, and really for freshman members, the quality of your staff, your chief of staff is key to making that, that term uh, successful. So really but very different experiences, but running the gamut for Indian country um, with our Native American represent representation in the House. Just both with Congress and the administration is how do we ramp up support during the pandemic? Uh, tribes are trying to get through all sorts of issues ranging from economic to health. Um, how does that work now? What, what are the next steps to look for? And in, in terms of their priorities ter and- Right, in terms of priorities and turning it into action. Exactly, and and those can be tough things to do. It, um, while it seems like there are thousands of bills, well, there are thousands of bills that are introduced every Congress. Very few of them get passed into law. Um, you, you know, it was noted throughout um, the, the the press run up and the coverage to Congresswoman Holland's nomination that she was one of the more successful freshman members in getting legislation passed. She had three, three or well three that were relevant to Indian country, particular to Indian country, that were very significant. Those things, uh, you know, you can get a bill introduced, but finding the time to get a hearing, um, building support um, but both on both sides of the aisle. So finding that consensus, I, I, I think everyone goes in with an idea of what their top priorities are. That the ability to communicate those both to house leadership, translate that into legislative language, 
that is actually going to get something done on the ground and then moving it through through committee those those take time those take a lot of relationship building and i expect that so when you ask for what the hurdles are i think th those are the hurdles they they take time and in this particularly partisan atmosphere everyone's got their work cut out for them and and making those efforts particularly under you know what this congress is starting under um with the vote in the house on um on the certification of the electoral college um, a very heated senate race two heated very senate races going on in georgia so i think finding that focus and finding partners making your voice heard to leadership as 100 as one of 435 members of congress those are the hurdles well we'll have to leave it there thank you holly cook Macaro, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon yes thank you thank you have a great day and that's our Indigenous world today. Thank you for watching. We'll be back with another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark Trahan. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.